the moment these organizations and these councils come together to form all these rules, what that does is that it blocks out. Their rules tend to block out the people who are looking for work or people who are looking for job opportunities. And that environment should not be allowed. How do we liberate South Africa's economy? Well, here to share some potential solutions is Pumlani Majosi. He is a well-known economic and social commentator. Pumlani, welcome to Solutions with David Ansara. When we look around us, we see persistent poverty, very high levels of unemployment and anemic growth. How did we get into this situation? Well, it's, it's very, it very much has to do with a very you know, underperforming economy. Right, an economy that has produced very shocking unemployment rates. Right now, as we have seen over the years, um, we've really reached the levels that are disturbing um, in the country. And that poses a very big challenge for people because if people cannot find work, David, if people cannot wake up, wake up, wake up in the morning to go and earn a wage, that will you know, present a very big challenge. Now, the question is, how do we deal with that you know, that very high unemployment rate. And I do believe that it very much has to do with public policy. If we can get public policy right in the country under this, uh, under this government we have, we can make significant progress. All right, so in many ways, we are the authors of our own destiny and the policy choices that we make impact on people's lives, their livelihoods and their access to opportunity. But now you talk about the current government, but the current government has a specific way of seeing the world, a particular ideology, and that manifests in its policy choices. Could you speak to that, please? Yes, it's a troubling uh, trend within the current government uh, that we have. Well, we basically see um, the, the big failure, or basically the belief that government has to lead the economy, which is not true. You know, the economy needs to be left in the hands of the private sector, you and I people who, who you know, create business, who sell and buy in the market, those, that is the approach we need to take. And our government seems to be you know, not believing in that, um, or at least to an extent that is required for us to get to say plus 4% economic growth. For example, you know, there is still a refusal um, to basically embark on massive or radical of very much effective privatization in the country. Of course, we can see how bad uh, the state-owned enterprises are performing. So, and they are consuming a lot of taxpayers' money. This is money that could be used to finance poor people in the country. Yet that money is used to finance underperforming businesses, businesses that are owned by government. Uh, so if, if, if those companies, if, if government could let go of those companies and those com companies are consumed by the private sector, we will see spending being refocused, right? And we are not going to see wasteful uh, expenditure. You look at also, you know, the current minimum wage laws, uh, laws that we have, David, I think they are really undesirable in a country that has basically the highest unemployment rate in the major emerging markets world. That is, to me, is not the right idea. We need to, you know, rather do away with minimum wages, so that we give people an opportunity to get in the market, to work their way up and earn a higher wage. Because the more people sit at home, that is more destructive than people going to, you know, at least having a chance to wake up in the morning to go and earn and, and, and a wage, even though that wage may be low, but they can learn from, get, gain the skills from there so that they build up to a, um, you know, to, to, to work that pays a higher wage. Uh, so th I think those, those issues are very much troubling. We are also seeing very much increasing uh, government spending um, that is really indebting us all. Um, and this, by the way, this government spending, it needs to be financed by taxes, which basically means that somewhere, somehow, you will need to raise taxes. Um, and, the, the, and the raise of taxes in an economy that is underperforming is very destructive. All right, well, Pumlani, you mentioned minimum wages, and I think... One of the big handbrakes on South Africa's economy is our very restrictive uh, labor regulatory framework, which effectively locks millions of people out of the labor market. So something like the national minimum wage, which was championed by the president, uh, is seen as uh, something of a, the product of a social compact. 
that now business, labor, and uh, government come together and they, uh, you know, form this pact uh, to set wages at a certain level. But what you're effectively saying is that anybody beneath that level who doesn't have the skill uh, to compete uh, in the market, they are disallowed to work. And, you know, that strikes me as, as pretty inhumane. Uh, what are some of the other blockages in, in our labor market that, that need to be unblocked in order to get more people into regular work? Yes, just one thing also to mention, David, it's that you don't need a minimum wage in South Africa to raise people's incomes. The data is very clear that those who have higher skills, those who have, um, you know, some form of, you know, qualification or educational qualification that is in demand in the market, they are going to make high income. So I have argued, David, that part of addressing this issue, in fact, at the top amongst them, the things that need to be done to address this issue is investment in human capital, right? Education and skills development, so that people can raise their, um, you know, their wages um, because you know they have had um, an improvement in education as well as skills development. And also, I want to mention this, um, um, David, and that is we also when we deal with the issues of unemployment. We also need to deal with the issues of immigration, the immigration problems that we have in South Africa, the poorest borders, right, that we've had under the ANC um, that have caused sig significant problems in the country, right? So part of that, we also need to, co we, need to and we, we should be pro-immigrants in the country. We need to get as many immigrants as we need in South Africa, right? But that should be controlled because the moment you have an overflow or an influx of underskilled already people from other African countries, that will also suppress the wages in the country. And that cause can cause also some lab labor market chaos in the country. So, I mean, all those things, they, they very much have to do with government policy, uh, David. Government needs to address all those things. And also the issue of labor costs, you know, even the World Bank, David, has done studies that shows studies that show South Africa's labor costs are higher compared to other emerging markets, right? Now, people like to push back and say that, well, if you are saying, uh, if you are saying that our labor costs are higher, are you saying that people should receive slave wages? No, nobody should receive slave wages, but people should have a chance to go out in the market to end both not all way, not all kinds of work, you know, uh, pay uh, what you can call slave wages. Um, no, some, some, work, some works pay more, some they pay less. So people should have an opportunity to build skills, to gain the knowledge so they can move on to, to the next job. So the issue of labor costs, it needs to be addressed to be addressed in, in, in our labor market and government needs to, needs to look at that so, so that we become a competitive nation. Uh, in comparison to other emerging markets, because we lose ground when it, when it comes to competitiveness. Even the data shows that when it comes to competitiveness, South Africa has a very much a, you know, um, a significant uh, problem there. All right, so Pumlani, one of my theories about why the cost of labor is so high is because of the extension of collective bargaining agreements to non-parties. So here we have another example of the social compact at work, big business, organized, labor unions, they come together and agree in a sector specific way, what wages they're going to set for their particular industry. So if it's the steel industry, uh, NUMSA and the big steel associations will come together and, and forge an agreement. But then even if non-parties who are not even participating in these discussions are part of the same industry, they have to apply those wages, those agreements to their own workforces. And that, to me, seems to be a big driver of, of, of why um, the cost of labor is going up, but not necessarily the productivity or the efficiency. Yes, it does. Because I don't think the person who's not a participant should be forced to comply with those rules, right, that have been, that have been set by, by that group. And also, okay, and, and, and another issue, David, it's that the, the unemployed in those councils um, and you know, and and um, and groupings uh, and organizations—they are not represented, and that troubles me. The unemployed people are not on the table to say, "Okay, yes, we are setting wages, but then um, you know, how will this affect us 
as those who are unemployed. So you have one group of people basically determine, determine the rules of the market and those rules will close out or will you know, decrease opportunities for those who are unemployed. Un the unemployed don't have a voice. And that is troubling to me um, because our unemployment levels, they are at a very disturbing levels. And for us to make progress in that front, we will need to make sure that it's easier for the unemployed to enter the market, right? The moment, we, the moment these organizations and these councils come together, to form all these rules, what that does is that it blocks out. Their rules tend to block out that people are looking for work or people are looking for job opportunities. And that environment should not be allowed. Who should um, you know, not allow that environment? I think obviously the government is very much can control that. It should control that. Um, but then in South Africa, as we all know, um, government itself is aligned with various interest groups, which again, is counterproductive for the rest of, of the country. So Pumlani, you said that government is aligned with various interest groups. What do you mean by that? One clear um, you know, thing we can see is that we see very much an alliance between um, the government and labor unions, the government being led by the, the, the current governing party, the African National Congress, the ANC. Um, we can see that they, they are very much working together uh, they support one another in times of election. In times of elections, uh, there will be an uh, there's there is an, an, an you know upcoming uh, ANC's elective conference. You will see labor unions there being involved. So that to me is troubling, right? Um, that we are seeing that that kind of um, you know um, uh, you know partnership. But it can change. It's just that it would be a, a, a long process. It can change because so long as we can have, uh, you know, a governing party that does not really, you know, coordinate or is friends with interest groups, interest groups like labor unions, um, that's where we can see the change. But for now, we are not seeing that. And South, Africa's, uh, South, South Africans are paying the price. Yeah, and I think there's not necessarily a problem with having trade unions. In fact, trade unions are very important actors in civil society for kind of collective interests of, of workers. Uh, but what I think is the problem is the political economy issue that you raised here, that, that the interests of the organized unions and the government are combined, and then they often act in concert. Um, and, you know, that creates all sorts of distortions in terms of policy. But I just wanted to come back to your earlier comment about immigration, Pumlani. Um, so, just to clarify what you're saying, that you know, South Africa obviously has these very porous borders, um, but that we need to attract the right kinds of skills, uh, the, and that might mean being open to immigration. So having, uh, I suppose one could say, high walls but open doors, that you control the sovereignty of the country, who's coming in and out, but that you're open to the skills that you need. I mean, a counter argument to that would be, how does government determine who are the, the highly skilled and who are the less skilled, uh, you know, that seems to perhaps introduce a lot more bureaucracy and, and decision-making power into the hands of government again. Well, some things will need to be done by government. Uh, the army is usually, uh, you know, controlled by the government. Um, the justice system, it has to be there and is controlled by government, the courts and so on. So of course, I'm not an anarchist. I'm not saying that there should be no government. I will never support that and I don't support that. There are specific basic functions that need to be, that, that need to be performed by government. And one of them is also the control of borders. Will it cost money? Yes, it, it will cost some sort of money. Um, um, will it have some sort of you know, uh, bureaucracy? Yes, there will be that, uh, that bureaucracy. Um, the, the, the question is, uh, in, how much can we make it as less costly as possible? That should be the goal, right? In other words, our visa process should be easy, right? We should create the systems and an environment where we can say, okay, here's David. David is from this country, and therefore he has these skills, and you now we quickly let the person in. We don't have to make, have a long sort of lengthy process that is costly. We should make it easy for people to come into this country in the right way, um, and also make sure that uh, you know, we do have the mechanisms to ensure that um, 
our borders remain, remain strong, um, that we don't just allow anybody who's here illegally. I think that's, that's very important. Um, that, we, well, that will cost money again, David, that will cost money. But the question is how can we make it as less corrupt and as less bureaucratic as, as, as possible? For me, I think that's very important because at the end of the day, we are a country, we need to be a country. Um, I'm not one of those people who believe that Africa is, is ready for the borderless world, that there should be no borders in Africa. I don't believe in that. We are not ready for that. Um, there perhaps will be a point where, where we are ready, but at this point, we are not. So it's an issue that our government needs to get, needs, needs to get right. And the, our, our, our current rulers, or the governing party, I should say, just over the past 25 years of our democracy, they've struggled. In fact, they've failed to get this, this, this issue right. And as a, as a result, we are seeing many wrong things popping up in the country that should have been dealt with and they have failed to deal, to deal with those things. You find that even the way they respond today, they are responding incorrectly. So we need to have the, the right policies there. Building a country is not easy. It requires sacrifice and it requires people who are determined and hard at work who believe in the ideas that will make the country forward. Um, so for me, I think that's very important, David. Those things are very important to take into account. And do you think there's an element of blaming foreigners or others for our own self-inflicted problems? And I mean, I remember once listening to the radio and there was a lot of heated debate around foreign spaza shop owners. And one of the South African spaza shop owners called in to complain and he said, well, you know, it's so unfair, these Somali uh, shop owners they get up and open their store at 5 a.m. We only open our store at 6 a.m. And my thought when I heard that was, well, why didn't you open your store at 5 a.m. as well and compete? So do you think that we have the right attitude in terms of our approach to competition, uh, that drive and hard work that you spoke of? And how, how can we kindle that in our, in our society? You see, the, the fact that we blame immigrants for everything, um, the idea of blaming immigrants, that's very wrong to me. I, I think we, we, we shouldn't do that, blame immigrants. Uh, we, must, we, must, we must compete, we must learn to be a competitive society, and we are not. Even our government is not a competitive government. It's a government that does not believe in competition, David. Because if, 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 if they did believe in competition, then they would take into account that we are ranked right you know, amongst the bottom countries when it comes to competitiveness in this country. So we don't know what is what competition is, and we have we have no you know frameworks and structures to advance our competitiveness. We don't have that. So the idea that we can blame immigrants, to me, I think that is wrong. Um, for of course we have to complain that um, our borders are porous, right? But to generalize and say that we can't have um, someone from Pakistan Pakistan starting a, a spaza shop, why not? So long as that, that person is here legally, uh, that's not an issue, um, not David. Uh, if I'm here legally, I can do, I can start any business, whether it's a spaza shop, whether it's an investment company. So long as I'm here legally, I can do all of that. Um, now, the question is, how do we get to the point where people realize that? And my view is that we also have leaders who themselves, you know, propagate, you know, xenophobia in the country. And that troubles me. The moment we have people who do not really say, well, we have failed in terms of addressing our problems as a nation. Um, instead, they choose to propagate um, some kind of xenophobia, which we don't want in the country. Uh, because you don't have to be, to say that we need to have, we need to sort out our immigration problems. It doesn't make you, you know, um, xenophobic. You can just say that, yes, we need to address these fundamental problems um, and open up the markets and so on and so on. And at the same time, we must make sure that we, we keep track as to who, who comes in and comes in and out of the country and how do we make sure that we have secured borders. So I think for me, that is very important, but it must be done not in a manner that you know, propagates xenophobia, as some of our leaders tend to do that. All right. Well, Pumlani, why don't we turn the conversation now to some solutions. I think we've documented a lot of the problems in South Africa quite effectively here in this conversation. But what would you propose that South Africa starts to, to implement to address some of these really, these deep structural problems in its economy and its society more broadly? Okay, number one, if I were president of South Africa, I would do away with the minimum wage, or at least I would push to do away with the national minimum wage law. 
Um, I think that's very, very destructive um, in the country. Number two, I would go along and cut taxes, right? We have taxes are just a problem in the country. Um, and the reason why they, these politicians keep them rising is because they want to finance their spending. So that means if you want to cut taxes, then you must cut, cut spending as well. So spending cuts and tax cuts, I think they are very important. Now, people will ask, will ask so what, what, what are you going to cut from land? Well, the first thing I would do is to do away with state-owned enterprises. Because we are putting in billions of friends there, um, taxpayers' money, putting pressure on taxpayers, which obviously results in taxes being raised in some form or another as government our government tries to, you know, uh, to finance these companies. So I'm doing all with those, um, with state-owned enterprises, uh, which means we should help us fiscally. Um, dealing also, I'm just making it easier that we, we deal with our, um, our borders, as you've just said, that we strengthen them and that we create a, a society where it's very easy for people to come into the country, but the right people that we need. To me, I think that's very important, making the visa process even easier, um, it's, it's critical to, to move our tourism forward and to, to create a prosperous, uh, a prosperous country. So those things, I think they are very important, um, you know, David, uh, to get right. Now, there's also one thing that you and I haven't spoken about, and that is the family breakdown in the country. When you look at the family breakdown, it's just, it's at shocking levels. So that's one thing we need to deal with as a society. Now, that one, David, people usually ask me, so what would you do as government to reverse the family breakdown? But that one, you know, it's, it, that one government can do as much to reverse such things, right? Um, it's us as people who need to get back to the culture of just making sure that how we, we put together families, the importance of the marriage, that's critical. But it's clear that the kids who are born in, fam in, you know, in, in a family with mom and dad, growing up with mom and dad, those kids are far more likely to make progress in life. I think that's very important. We should never by any, you know, underestimate the importance of that. And in many cases, all that it lies at, um, in fact, if you can sort that thing out, you could fix many problems in the country, including crime. Right. Now, another thing that I will deal with as soon as possible, I'm removing BE, right, if I'm president of South Africa, or at least I would strive or push for the removal, because I don't think our president can just grab the laws. Um, so I would push and galvanize our people to remove BE. We don't need BE to, to we, we don't need the idea of BE or BE to help black people progress. We don't need that, right? We can have, what we see what I believe in David is what's called non-racial affirmative action, right? Some people have called it that, where you do help people, but don't help them because of their race, right? So I do believe in affirmative action, but it should be a non-racial affirmative action. Because if it's racial, you'll end up, you'll end up help, helping a child who lives in Sentin, a black child who lives in Sentin, whose mother is a medical doctor, um, and dad is a huge businessman and you're helping the child simply because of the color of their skin. We don't do that. And if you help by socioeconomic background, uh, not factoring in race, you will help, you will help the, the right person. And guess what? It will, largely, it will likely be the black person again because those are the, it tends to be the, the, they, the black people tend to be the most victims of um, you know, um, of poverty and so on and so on in the country. So if you take that approach, you will still be helping um, black people, but at least you'll be helping them in a way that comes with dignity, respect, um, a sense of, um, you know, at least they will, they will feel that they are being helped because they are poor and not because of them, of the color of, the, of their skin. Yeah, and I think a big part of the conversation that's often missing about empowerment is this very nature of the word empowering. You want people to be individual economic agents, to feel like they have decision-making power, that they have opportunities that they can pursue. doesn't mean that you're just gifting somebody something on a silver platter, that is true. but that you're is giving true. them access to that opportunity. Exactly. And one thing also, um, uh, David, um, our government ought to have a goal to slash down social crimes. That should be the long-term goal, right? That, okay, here's our target plan. 
Uh, here's our plan. Uh, here are our target dates. Here's the here's what we 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 want to do um, to reduce the number of social grants recipients. That should be the goal. That should be the long term goal. Now having that long term goal would you know um, have to include um, or would need would need to be accompanied by the by the very important uh, reforms, of course, that will help people so that they really find jobs to, to, to sustain themselves and to sustain their, their, their kids, uh, not having to rely or having to get, or having to think that the state will give them money uh, to raise their kids or to, to finance their, their, their lives. And I'm talking about abled person here, able, able people. Um, that should be the goal. David, to, there must be a goal and a target and, you know, you know, targets and plans and all that on how we slash down um, social grants because they create government dependency. We see people relying on government. And, and to me, I don't think that's, that, that's good. We see uh, politicians using that social grants as a tool to control people. To me, that is just, you know, inhumane and disrespectful, disrespectful and patronizing, um, we need to do away with it. And our goal is to have an environment where everybody lives on their own money, the money that they've earned through their productivity in the market. And you don't think that there'd be an argument for gradually tapering uh, welfare grants, so rather focus on liberalizing the labor market maintain the existing grant infrastructure and then let people basically grow their way out of that welfare dependency. Well, but is, is that goal there? That goal, that gradual, was, I've, I've heard that word gradual often that we need to decrease this thing you know, gradually, but is there a plan? Even though you can say you have, um, things should be done gradually, but you should, have, you should have a year where you say by this year, this is our goal, we should slash the recipients by say 40% by this year. And then by that year, you may have not achieved that, David. That will be fine. At least you are striving to that. Just show the numbers of how you have achieved. Are those goals there? And those goals are not there. What you are saying right now is usually said in passing. Ah, you know, we just need to decrease this, you know, gradually. Um, and then that gradual becomes permanent. No one really has a plan put down, you know, put down to say by this date, here's what we want to. We want to, you know, we want to, we want to achieve, and we are going to give you feedback by then as to how much we have achieved. Rather, David, we are seeing celebration, you know, celebrations of social grants. I don't think that that should be celebrated. It troubles me that the ruling party celebrates and sees this as achievement, which means that then those plans, uh, those long-term plans and target target dates and so on. We're not going to see them, uh, David, um, because really they see this as an achievement. And that to me is troubling. Yeah, and I think what is quite interesting, though, about the welfare system is that, as Tony Leon mentioned on this podcast, it is actually distributed in a non-racial way. So getting back to your point around alternatives to BE, is that we, we do have some models uh, of non-racial welfare provision in the country. Um, you, just getting back to your point about non-racialism and empowerment, uh, why do you think that uh, the, these racial arguments hold uh, such uh, emotional valence for, for so many people in our country's politics? And how do we get out of this uh, kind of racial binary mode that we're currently stuck in? The, 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 the people who are driving that, that narrative, um, are very much politicians, they are very good at dividing us uh, at creating the false narrative that what matters to, 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 to the average South African is race, you know, or racism is an issue. Now, the surveys that have been done, they don't show that people, they rank at the top unemployment, you know, security, the crime problem, uh, corruption, service delivery. Those are things that people mention at the top. We, the surveys that have been done, really, you don't see racism in those surveys. Yet politicians make it as if it's, um, it's something, you can see even the way, the way they campaign, that they, they, they think that at the core of our problems, really we have racial, you know, um, racial issues. 
uh, which is very much wrong. Uh, but, uh, and, and the, but then one thing to say is that the, the, the race narrative still dominates in our politics, right? Um, and therefore, that is why I always say that the moment you enter into politics, you want to contest in elections, or you become a politician, you will need to factor in the fact that that racial narrative is there in the country. And the question is how to, how can you counter it in a, you know, in a rational manner, in a rational approach, so that you don't worsen, um, you know, or try to divide the country. Um, and, and I think for me, uh, that's very important as to how you do it. You see, th there's nothing wrong, David, if I, were, if I were a politician and I campaign that, that you know, there's still a gap um, um, between, um, for example, um, uh, the racial groups in the country. That is fine, you can raise that, because the data does show that. But then you should propose, you can propose BE as the way to resolve that issue, right? If you're a politician, you can acknowledge that, that's fine. If you see it as, you see it as an issue that we have racial, racial inequality, that's fine. In politics, you can acknowledge that, but then your proposals should not say we need BE. Because BE won't resolve that. We've seen that it won't work. Your proposal should not be that we need minimum wage laws. Laws. No, that should not be your proposal. You shouldn't propose more regulations. No, you shouldn't do that, right? Rather open up the market uh, so that you give people the opportunity you know, to thrive, invest in human capital, skills development, and so on. Because those who are left behind, they're left behind boss, they don't have the best um you know um skills and education and so on that makes them competitive in the market so if you can sort of focus on that uh you are going to you know raise the standards of of living for many people in the country and i think our leaders get it wrong they always want to stoke you know um you know racial divisions um people being emotional of a race whereas uh practically speaking people really um, you know, race and racism, it's not really the fundamental, um, you know, uh, problem or one of the problems that they face in their communities. Yeah, I think most uh, people in underprivileged communities are just trying to get by, they're trying to earn an income, trying to protect their families. What do you think is driving South Africa's very high levels of crime? Because if you look at other countries, I mean, I've visited India, I spent a bit of time there, very high levels of poverty when I was in 2007. That's greatly reduced, by the way, uh, since then. But you didn't really seem to have the same levels of violent crime. Uh, you can think of a country like Malawi, for example. That's much poorer than South Africa, but they don't have the very high levels of crime that we have, at least that's uh, as far as I know. So what's the factor there? Why do we have such high levels of crime? Well, you know, um, the... It, this has nothing to do with poverty, and I like your opening because you've just laid out the fundamental policy where people say that the cause of this um, uh, of this uh, shocking crime rate that we have it's um, it's poverty. I'm glad you've mentioned that. It's 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 got nothing it's nothing to do with poverty, right? Now I'm I'm I'm, I'm very much I'm one of those people who who argue that the way which means I'm on the side of Thomas Sowell. I think you and I know that, I know that economist, David. Um, Thomas Sowell says that the way to address crime, the shocking crime, is to have a very effective justice system, right? You need an effective justice system. Um, you need to be tough on crime. And I do believe in that stance. That we need to be tough on criminality. You know, we shouldn't, we should avoid, um, you know, these things like bail policies where people just leave, uh, they get arrested and then they are released on bail and so on. I think there has to be a change, uh, David, in how we fight crime in the country. We need to be tough on crime. Now, I'm not talking about abuse, police abusing people. Wherever there's abuse, that needs to be, you know, the, the police who abuse people, they need to be sorted out, right? They need to be, they need to be, um, to, to be held to account. I'm not talking about abuse, but I'm talking about the tough response to crime. I think we need that. To reduce crime, we need to be tough on it. Now, the other guys on the left, they tend to blame this. Well, if we can have, the reason why we have shocking rates of crime is because there are no sufficient incomes and people don't have sufficient incomes. We need to get them jobs. 
David, the murder rate, the fact that we have, I think last time I checked, uh, you will correct me if you are aware of the statistics. Last time I checked, um, almost about 500 people are murdered per week in South Africa. The daily murder rate, it's at a shocking level, right? Tell me, David, are you going to really kill people just because you're poor? If you want a cell phone, why don't you take it and go away, right? If you want whatever you want, take it and leave, David. You don't have to murder and shoot the people, the person to death. Why, why, why are you killing them? So, I mean, it, there is no, we need to have a system that is accountable, right? Um, um, and, and also another root cause as well um, that we need to look, and this is also another long-term issue as well, um, uh, David, the absence, the absence of fathers in homes. The global research around the world has clearly shown that criminals, most criminals really, it's people who never grew up with their parents, I mean, with their father. And that is problematic, right? Um, so, and we also need to, the, the family breakdown contributes to rising, you know, um, uh, crime or contributes to crime um, in a very big, uh, in a very big extent. So we need to address the issues of the family breakdown as well as people um, so that we have, you know, um, we, we, we sort things out as a nation over, over the long term. So, I mean, for me, I, I really don't buy this thing that poor, we should blame poverty. That, for example, I was a hijacked last December, that I must, I must say those people were poor, that they hijacked me and pointed me with guns. So I must somehow think that, well, these are just poor people. Only if we can, we can the left says that only if we could redistribute wealth to them. No, 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 uh, David, if you are breaking the law or you kill other person, you must be dealt with, right? Now, I'm one of the people who have been controversial in the sense that, my view is that the issue of capital punishment in South Africa, it needs to be brought back on the table and how we can, but before it's even brought back on the table, if it's ever brought back on the table, it needs to be accompanied by the justice system reform because we'll need to adjust that. You don't have, we, we reduce the chances of having innocent people being executed, right? So I think to me that would be wrong. So having such will need to be accompanied by a very much radical justice system reform that ensures that there are different layers. We can even add layers when it comes to investigations and, and so on and trials and, and, you know, and, 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 and convictions. We need to improve our justice system and be tough on criminality because otherwise that, that will present, that will continue on this path, um, 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 David, and, and, and you know, we, we are going to suffer. We are already suffering, and, and it's a shock. Yeah, from Lani, you know, I think that that death penalty question is quite a controversial one. I mean, I think uh, I'm very concerned about limiting the power of the state. And I wouldn't want to give the, the state that extraordinary power, um, uh, that extreme use of force. Yeah, it's a different debate. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and whether or not that actually has the deterrent effect. I mean, my view would be improve the uh, prosecution rate that you know that if you commit a crime, there's a very high likelihood that you are going to be punished for that. I think the severity of the punishment may not be a deterrent. Um, but, you know, I also wanted to pick your brain about where South Africa is politically, Pumlani, because we've undergone a pretty dramatic election in November 2021. The local government elections, the ANC now below 50%. Do you see prospects for political realignment in the next election? How do you see this playing out? Well, I think we are definitely headed to what's called um, coalition politics, um, David. That's where we are headed. The ANC is losing ground. In the recent local government elections, they had the least, the lowest support since 1994. We look at the numbers. So, we are headed to coalition politics. Now, um, it's just, it will depend what, what, what these coalitions will look like, uh, because if we, are, if, we are, if we are going to have uh, uh, an alliance between the NC and the EFF, the far left EFF, economic freedom fighters, uh, led by Julius Malema, I think that will present really a very big problem for South Africa. Uh, we are going to hit a big pothole if that's the case. But if if those coalitions, um, you know, they're led by organizations like or political parties like uh, the Democratic Alliance, I think Hem and Mashaba as well, 
um, whom I like. I think he 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 is right on on the, on some of the many fundamental uh, issues and other sort of right center, right and right center organizations. If we have coalitions that are led by those parties that are right center and the right, I think South Africa will be better off. But if the coalitions that we have are led by um, you know uh, people who are either left who have left and far left, that should be quite problematic. So there are those scenarios. But we are headed to coalition politics. Um, and um, I'm, I'm not sure what would this mean, David, but uh, all I know is that if it's right, right center, that would be, this would be better for South Africa. If it's the other side, it, 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 will not be, it will not be good. So we'll just need to wait and see in 2024, but no doubt that the NC is losing ground. It's, it is in decline, and I'm saying good, it should be in decline. Um, but it's also, we also, it's also good to see the right center, right, you know, parties also gaining ground, as we saw in the, in the last, you know, local government elections, because they will challenge the left, which would be good. Now, some people say, David, you know, those coalitions will sort of present a stalemate, right? Where things are not being done because there'll be a stalemate, coalitions not really coming into, into, um, into, into final decisions on policy implementation and so on. But I, I still argue that if, if it's a right, right center kind of led coalitions and so on, pragmatism will take shape, right? Well, that's where we are going to see um, the ideas that actually we government doesn't have to own businesses are being factored into account that we need to deal with the problems of regulations and so on speedily. I think we are, we are going to see that if the coalitions we have are right and right center. Um, but the possibility of right, right center, I think to me, if the probability of having those is quite lower than the left and then and, 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 and the left guys taking over, which makes me predict that we are still going to face the worst times in South Africa. So if you were faced with a situation in 2024 where the ANC had reduced its majority and were tempted by an, an EFF coalition and the DA had to say, well, in order to prevent this outcome, we will go in with the ANC. Do you think that that would be a wise thing for the DA to do? I have my reservations, but what do you think? Listening, listening to John, John Steenhuisen, the leader of the DA, he seems to think that they will, they will do, they, they, may, they will consider doing that, and that they may do that. They may go into a coalition with the NC in 2024 or beyond, I don't know. And, and his view is that it's just because he, at least that's what I heard him saying, that he sees Ramaphosa as a reformer, right? So he thinks, he says that to avoid South Africa becoming a Marxist country or slipping into Marxism, they will go in for those, for the, you know, they will go in to, 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 to government the ANC or in a coalition with in a coalition with the ANC. Um, would that be the good idea? Well, you know, I, I'm not sure if it would be a very bad idea, David. It would prevent the worst, no doubt, and I understand their strategy. Uh, or at least I've learned to understand that strategy. It will prevent the, the worst. Um, and maybe it may be a better idea in the sense that them being in power, they would pressure the NC, right? Because I don't, the DA will have also some support and affiliates and therefore they will pressure the NC to keep on, you know, or to implement the right reforms, right? Um, then to, for them to sit back and let the country collapse completely in the hope that when it's it's entirely collapsed, that you know they will have a chance to take over the country. It may be difficult to convince SA voters, um, even in those circumstances, to vote for DA. They seem to be rather choosing to stay at home, David, which is troubling. People are choosing to stay at home than to go to vote. Um, so for me, I, I've learned to kind of understand what would be the motive for the DA. They would be saying, well, we are doing this to avoid the worst that would come if the NC and the EFF, you know, they are the leaders in the country. And I think I do understand that with that perspective. So Pumlani, as we close this conversation, I think something that I've observed in your writing and in your public commentary 
is this theme of personal freedom, but also personal responsibility, which I think is a very important thing to emphasize and which we've covered here today. But just as a closing remark from you, what would you say is the importance of taking personal responsibility in your life and in your community? You see, you and I, David, have over the past 45 minutes or so, uh, or an hour, we have been talking about um, government policy, what this government can do to improve the economy, you know, to have, have a country with less crime, a country with, you know, that can control, you know, immigration and so on and so on. All, 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 the, all, all the stuff you and I have been talking about, it's all what government should do, right? But then, here's the thing, David, even if our government would have the best policies in the world and so on and so on, and they do all the things that you and I have been talking about, if there is no personal responsibility so that we as people, we pursue education intensely, that we save and invest, right? That we choose to rather wait until really we can afford to have children. Um, and if we don't work hard, have the strong work ethic, um, and if we don't see marriage in our lives at some point as something that can that is good for, the, for our families and society, if we don't see all those things, David, that have to do with personal responsibility, if we don't do those things, no matter how best government policies can be, we're not going to benefit much, right? We'll remain at the, at the bottom. And, um, you know, we will continue complaining that inequality this, inequality that, when in fact we should be looking in the mirror and fixing ourselves. Because let me tell you one thing, even if the policies are bad, as you and I, I think, agree that public policies are not in good shape, those who really pursue the five things I've just spoken about, who take personal responsibility and work hard to improve their lives, their skills and productivity and, and, productivity and so on, they are doing better. Even though we have a bad economy and bad conditions, they are doing better than those who are not doing anything, who lay back and make wrong decisions that destroy their lives. They are doing better. So at the end of the day, I think the emphasis really, and what in fact, what I always emphasize is personal responsibility because how bad our political leaders can be or policy makers, at least we can be not too worse. You know, we can make things a little bit better by personal responsibility. Kumlai Majosi, thank you very much for joining me on the podcast. Great, sir. It's great to talk to you, and I hope we will talk again sometime in the future. If you enjoyed this conversation and you're watching on YouTube, please do hit that like button and also subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. Also, I'd be hugely grateful if you could comment down below. Also, if you are listening on your preferred podcast platform, why don't you subscribe to the show? Also, share it with your friends or family who might find it of interest. My name is David Ansara. This is the Solutions Podcast. Until next time, take care.